you know, the best time to invest in India was in July 1991, the day before, I think, May or June, before Manmohan Singh presented his liberalization budget, which changed the course of the Indian economy. It completely changed the course of the economy. So the best day was then. The second best day was today. Okay? You you know, you can't win if you don't play the game. You know, you yeah. if you don't make shoot the basket, you're not going to make the basket out there. You have to play to win. So in order to understand the stock market and profit, you have to invest in the stock market. And over time, you'll get better at it. Is this a good time to invest? Absolutely a good time to invest. Uh, would I be investing now? Absolutely, I'd be investing now. Would I tell the young people to invest today? Absolutely, I'd invest. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us for the 46th episode of our podcast. We're here with India's 10th biggest investor, Mr. Ramesh Ramani. He talked to us about his life's journey, what brought him to the stock markets, the successes and failures, and what they taught him about being a better investor. He also shared his insight on how to navigate uncertain times in the stock market, how to find the right investment themes, as well as what he sees coming in the future for India. Please do join us. This is a really special episode. and I'm absolutely confident that there's a lot that you can learn from this. Thank you. So, Mr. Damani, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Um, we're very, very grateful that you've taken the time to join us today and share your wisdom with us. As you know, we're on a mission to try and create smarter investors in this country. And uh, your experience and insight would be absolutely invaluable. So, well, thank you, Varun. I don't know about wisdom, but I'll definitely share some of my verbosity with you. So let's go. Absolutely. So I'd love to know about your journey into the stock market. You know, what brought you into investing and, in, you know, what inculcated that love for the markets in you? I think it's a well-known story, Varun. I mean, I, my father on a day sent me some money and I kind of lost it and that kind of intrigued me in the market. But it's also important to understand the motivations of a young man. Uh, when I was, you know, very young, just fresh out of college, wet behind the years, uh, you know, there was one thing that did drive me and that was financial freedom. And I, I, I never felt, uh, you know, Charlie Munger recently said that and kind of echoed with what I feel also. I never liked the idea of sending bills to someone to collect money. I just wanted to be the master of my own fate, the captain of my ship, if you will. You know. So while I was ideologically opposed to the stock market, didn't understand it in my early years of my career, I think ultimately the kind of freedom that it offered you, the freedom of expression, the freedom of finance, attracted me to the stock market. So in a way, it is something made for me because I think temperamentally, I'm a bit of a loner. I don't like a lot of my friends, for example, build big organizations because they're very successful brokers. But it never appealed to me. I always wanted to, you know, run something, thinking it through, reading a few journals, going through a balance sheet. So I think that's what the subconscious attraction to me in the stock market was. So interestingly, that first $10,000 that you lost, how did you end up losing that money? And uh, what was that in, if you don't mind yeah, asking? It's not embarrassing now. It's pretty embarrassing at that time. You know, now that I've made some money, I can talk about it with some humor. How did I lose that money? Uh, I made what is, you know, mistake 101 in the stock market that I drove while I was looking at the rear view mirror and not at the front view mirror. Stock market is always about looking in the front, discounting the future. I look backwards. What did I do? I bought the stock in the 80s. And if you remember, the period before that was a period of very high inflation. Mm -hmm. So all the gold, the real estate, the commodity companies had done well. So by the 80s, the correction had happened. The bull market was over and it stalled 50, 60 percent. So in my naivete, I thought, well, they're already down 50, 60, 70 percent. How much low can they go? Little did I realize they could go down another 50, 60, 70 percent from the price I bought them, which is exactly what happened. So round trip, I lost 10,000 very shortly. But the important thing was, and this is important to understand in the market, that sometimes uh, that is a very inexpensive tuition to pay, particularly early in your career. Mm -hmm. Because as a young man, you'll be ambitious and you'll say, how can I be so stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work, mm -hmm. which is what happened to me. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are sort of inspired <clears throat> by this idea that the markets deliver financial freedom. I think they're following in your footsteps <clears throat> and the footsteps of, of a lot of other successful investors. But I think... Particularly post 2020, a lot of the investors into the market are new and they haven't really developed an investment philosophy. They haven't really got a sense of how to build a portfolio or what to invest in. But you've obviously got the experience. So what's your investment philosophy today and how has that evolved through time? You know, you, I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, the 1969 classic, The Graduate by Dustin Hoffman. I don't believe I have. It's a classic movie. Go see it sometime. And he's a young man out of college and uh, he's looking, groping for answers. And uncle comes up and whispers to him, 
I have only one word for you, plastics. And the one word that I would suggest that everyone wanting to join the stock market in 2020, 2021, young, is understand compounding. It is the eighth wonder of the world, as Einstein called it. And it's the accelerator, if I can uh, pun on mm -hmm. your company, uh, of great performance in the market. You, to understand compounding is to understand how to be financially free, how to be wealthy, and understand how the markets really work. When you realize you take away the greed and the envy that follows us in the stock market, someone's always richer, someone's always got a better trade, someone's always done much better than you in the market. But you understand compounding. That's the way how money becomes wealth. I think that is, you know, the true magic sauce I have found in the market. And if you can compound over long periods of time at 22, 23%, no matter what you start off with, you will be very wealthy at the end of the journey. And that's what the stock market is about. At the end of the day, to make you wealthy at the end of the journey. It's not a quick fix plan. It's not like going to the races. It's not like buying a lottery ticket where overnight you become rich. It's a long, slow grind. And if you can't wait those 20, 30 years, you're probably better off playing the ponies. That makes a lot of sense. So... I want to try and dig into this a little bit deeper because obviously compounding is delivered by growth, right? And India is a growth, growth economy, growth country. But I think famously in your past, you've mentioned that you like value. You like looking at balance sheets, as you mentioned. So how do you find, <coughs> how do you find that balance between a company that's valued really well and a company that's growing really quickly? Because if we take the, the market today, a lot of the really high growth companies that are darlings of the market are very richly valued. And uh, like you mentioned, you don't want to buy something that's, that's you know, too badly valued. You want, you want to kind of buy the right stock. So how do you find that balance between growth and value? Well, I find often people make this mistake. It's the wrong question to ask whether I buy value or whether I buy growth. Value and growth are joined to the hip. They're cousin, in fact, even first cousins, I would say, to each other. Uh, growth is just a component of the value. You could have a stock in NVIDIA that is just going up, soaring in value because of growth. But the growth is providing the value. Then there are stocks that the market is not recognizing the value for. So growth is just a component of value. So I uh, don't particularly like the feeling that I'm a value investor, not a growth investor. I love growth, okay? But it has to come at a price. A mistake a lot of people made in this current bull market, for example, is to assume you buy growth at any price. Or you just buy a good company and that should be good enough. That's never true. Uh, you were in America and I, you were in UK. I was in America. And in the 1970s, there was what they call the Nifty 50 bubble. They also had the Nifty 50 stocks in America. The companies like Avon, Polaroid, Walmart, Exxon, whatever, Bank of America, that people said were one decision stocks. You buy them at any price and it doesn't matter because ultimately you'll end up making money. You can't do that. In the stock market, that's a very expensive lesson to learn because you make some money initially. And then, of course, the long correction was set in. And for 10 years, levers didn't make money. For 12 years, Infos didn't make money in India. So... You have to buy it at the right price. That's very important. And I think my foundation as an investor was understanding that, that I'm not opposed to value. I'm not opposed to growth. I think they're both this part of the same equation. But uh, to understand that, I think it took me a few years also. So this finding the right price for a company, like you mentioned, do you have some sort of thought process or framework that you, you go through? Or is it just years of experience and feel that you know that, okay, this is now at a right price? You know, I think most people would have understanding if they actually push themselves to do it. It's not that I have any special insights or understanding. The first thing you need to do, Varun, is you need to understand what the market cap of a business is. Number of shares are certain times the current price. You go to any decent software and get the market cap by, by rote almost, right? So you understand what a business is valued at. You add the debt to the company, you come with enterprise value. And then you ask yourself a very simple question. Would I pay that much to buy 100% of the company? Or would I, uh, you know, not pay that much if I were a private businessman? Now, most people are very afraid to ask themselves the question. So I'll give you two shortcuts. The first thing is try, say you're a novice investor. Instead of looking at companies like Reliance or Tata Steel, which are in the few lakh crores, you start up companies that are 1,000 crores, 2,000 crores, 5,000 crores, because you understand that business. And how do you understand the business in a sharper format? Look for your circle of competency. For example, you're a software person from your background. So you look at software companies. Maybe you look at software startups, the smaller end of software companies, not the Infosys TCS. It is called the circle of competency. So if you're a banker, you can look at the financial stocks. If you're a practicing doctor, you look at the medical, the pharmaceutical companies. And that will give you an edge that the last year gets, you know, a few years later. Because you're already in the business, you understand how the business is doing. 
So rather than being a mogul in software and uh, steel and salt and consumer business, try and find an area where you have an edge and use that edge to your advantage. So <clears throat> to come back to the point, uh, this is a Warren Buffett explanation. I think it's a great explanation for it. Is that, and I'll change the baseball analogy to the cricket an analogy so that people understand out there. You know, we tend to think of the stock market sometimes as a T20 game, that every ball you either score a run or get out because it is very important. You only get 120 balls uh, to play in an inning. So if every ball is of particular importance to you. The stock market is not like that. It's like a five day test match where you can bat for as long as you want two days, three days. And every time a pitcher throws a ball to you, imagine he's throwing a stock to you. Infosys at 1400, Reliance at 2500, uh, ITC at 400 rupees. And you have to do nothing. If you don't like the price that is being thrown at you, ignore the stock. But if it comes at a price that's very attractive to you because you've already done the homework in terms of market cap, in terms of the enterprise value, in terms of the prospects of the company, you say, how is that possible? And typically in bear markets, you'll find, as to use the cricket analogy, the white ball outside the off stomach, you can hit over the top for a six, okay? Right. Because there will be that kind of value delivered at that time. So market is very schizophrenic. You know, you don't, but the beauty is you don't have to do anything. You can wait three months, six months, eight months for the fat pitch outside the off stomach, which is a full top, you swing out of the bat. So it does require an enormous amount of patience. And it does require, as Warren Buffett says, temperament. You need the right temperament of uh, what you do. But occasionally, the market will give you this absolutely soft ball outside the off stomach, which you can hit out for a six. And that's what you want to do. It's not that by batting every day and hitting every ball, you're going to make a lot of money. It's by backing up the truck and buying when odds in your favor. That's when you make the serious money. I think that's a, that's a really lovely analogy because I think in your career as an investor, you've hit a, a fair few sixes as you know, you've identified the right points, the right trends. Um, I think Infosys when it was uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, recently, I think PSU and Railway and Defense stocks, I think you were fairly early with. So how do you find this? How do you find these? Um, how are you certain that what you've got is is a softie that you can really hit well, out It's the funny you ask me these questions because I told my wife a few days back that, you know, my stocks have been done well. And she replied as only a wife would that Kismat Balwan to Gada Pelwan. You know, so <laughs> she, she knows how to put me in my place. But levity aside, trying to understand what you're doing. Uh, I One of my first breaks in life was a company called CMC which did the entire railway computerization uh, project for the government of India. And when it got listed with a 20 crore market cap, and I knew from my background as a computer programmer that it was silly money. It couldn't be that way. I didn't understand markets, but I understood that you couldn't get a computer company that did the Indian railway system. They did the Bombay Stock Exchange system, 20 crores. You would probably spend 100 crores at IBM just to get a RFQ from them. Yeah. So I knew it was simple. I didn't understand markets, so I made a, a mistake, which I'll get to later. So it was within my circle of competency and it was the soft pitch outside the off stomach you could hit for a six. Because at 20 crores, I knew I couldn't lose money. How much would I made, even I didn't know about it, but it ended up being almost a hundred bagger. But leave that part aside. To give you a more contemporary example, because of that circle of competency I developed in the public sector stocks, I kept following that. And when this new round of PSUs came public, the defense and the railways you mentioned, I'd done my homework on them. You know, for example, to give you an example, a company called Mazgon Docs, which I own, so I'm not recommending it. It's just a disclosure that I do own a part of it yet still. The company was coming out as an enterprise value of a few thousand crores, 2,500 crores or something. But enterprise value was actually closer to zero because they had so much cash and land in the balance sheet that basically I was getting the business for free. And what were they getting in return for the business? I was getting an auto book of 50,000 crores, which would last them five or six years. So I knew for the next five, six years, they would make money and pay me a dividend. Right? So it was that great a bargain. So I, when I tell you the example that operate within your circle of competency, that was within my circle because I had watched these stocks of Merivita. Wait for the fat pitch outside the Ostrom. Here I was getting a company with basically an enterprise value of zero. And well, mm -hmm. the only thing I have to sit that if I throw a party where people show up or not. You know? Luckily right. for me, it worked out. Corporate governance improved. People understood the earnings and the stock multiplied many fold. So that, that is the part where luck and patience comes into play. But that's a classic example of how a value investor would tend to approach something. It's like your mother taught you how to shop. That's what you do in the stock market also. You want to buy something that you think is worth 1 rupee or 10 rupees or 100 rupees for a fraction of its price. And then there should be a trigger unlocking that value. Right. And that will typically happen if you buy a good, good company. That makes a lot of sense. 
But I think you mentioned a little bit earlier that there's some mistakes you've made. And I think uh, we learn more, my personal perspective is we learn more from our mistakes than we do from our successes. So what, what mistake taught you the most about investing and uh, helped you build your temperament more than anything else? You know, I, I don't know how much time I have in the podcast. The mistakes would take a lot more than the we got, right all, we got all day. We got all day to learn from you. <laughs> You'll be kind to me. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, it, it's a bit audacious and I want to make this point only because I think I'd like to inspire uh, your generation of, of viewers, the younger people who come to the market out there. Take me back to when I was a kid. I was I went to HR College, which is a local college out here. And at 20 years, I went to America, studied there uh, in America. So it's a bit audacious what I'm saying. But a lot of my friends here who had more worth, more... Uh, Panash, if you will, went on to become billionaires. And that was the size of the opportunity that was available to us. So while I can applaud myself in the back and say, you know, Ramesh, you've done well. And if you'd asked me, my younger self when I was 20, that if my net worth at 60 was this much, would I have been happy? I would say, get out of the park. I'd be thrilled to death. Okay. Here it is, I'm much richer than I thought I would ever be. And yet I'm more frustrated than I would ever be. Only because, I, not because I miss the money. I mean, the real value investors really don't care about the money. It's how you keep score, Varun. It's how you understand how you've done in life, you know. And what I regret is that the opportunities ahead of me were so great that I could only encapsulate some of them, okay. And I mean that as a self-criticism, not any other way. I'm perfectly happy with my life. I'm perfectly happy. God has been very good. I've been very blessed. But I wish uh, uh, I had seized the opportunity to the degree that my friends had seized it. So I think that was, you know, a big mistake uh, in making. You could have a successful career and still feel frustrated. And I don't know how to explain that, but that's part of it. No mix. I think that's that's interesting because... It's poignant. It's, it's poignant. Yeah, you're right. Because, you know, sure, in the 80s, the size of the opportunity was immense. But I don't think that that opportunity size has diminished today. I think, if anything, it's bigger even. I, I'm really glad to hear you say that because you're right, absolutely right. Each bull market will make you stronger, richer, and more powerful than the previous bull market. Yeah. So this is just the fourth or fifth bull market I'm experiencing. Okay. And the culmination of the efforts in the fifth bull market. By the time the seventh, eighth, tenth bull market rolls around, it'll be much bigger, much wider, and there'll be more opportunities for everybody, not just for me. So it's a good question. A lot of people say, oh, you guys are lucky you came in India when liberalizing in 91. The index was 1,000, now 75,000. You know, but you would say the same thing, the index is 150,000. You know, you'll say, oh my God, I wish I'd done that 75,000. So I was yesterday at a conference and someone asked me a similar question. And I said, you know, the best time to invest in India was in July 1991, the day before, I think May or June, before Manmohan Singh presented his liberalization budget, which changed the course of the Indian economy. It completely changed the course of the economy. So the best day was then. The second best day was today. Okay. You, you know, you can't win if you don't play the game. You know, you, yeah. if you don't make, shoot the basket, you're not going to make the basket out there. You have to play to win. So in order to understand the stock market and profit, you have to invest in the stock market. And over time, you'll get better. Is this a good time to invest? Absolutely a good time to invest. Uh, would I be investing now? Absolutely, I'd be investing now. Would I tell the young people to invest today? Absolutely, I'd tell them. But used as a, not as a five-week thing or a, even a few years thing. But use a 15-year, 25-year, 30-year stepping board. Look at the financial arc of your career, how it's going to take. And if you compound your money over the next 15, 20, 30 years at some reasonable rate, you're going to end up with very good prospects. That's, again, very, very, very poignant. So I want to kind of touch on this theme of opportunity for a little bit more. Um, so if you look at India today, you look at the opportunity that you have in front of us with your wealth of experience. Forget Forget stocks, forget investing, forget forget that side of things. Where do you feel the real opportunity from a business of value creation perspective lies that entrepreneurs in this country like myself can still unlock? You know what, there the are three forces that are driving uh, this change, but it's based on what I call the great Indian middle class being born. All right. You've lived in overseas society, you understand how middle class is there. And it's actually started with the Victorian England when people wanted better people to be nurses, to be doctors, to be, you know, technicians. So middle class was born. You had to pay them better. You had to improve the standard of living. By some understanding, a uh, gentleman called Pumi Kharas writes about this. He's the author I would recommend to people to read about. Uh, he talks about the great Indian, uh, 5 billion people joined the middle class in the world, the 8 billion of us, and the 5 billion people joined the middle class in the world. A lot of them are now coming from India. In fact, not from China, but from India. 
and the middle class is going to drive the change. And what is driving the change of these middle class? I call it a three-legged stool. It's democracy, which makes people, makes the politicians accountable to the people. If you don't deliver, they're thrown out. You know, so you have to deliver growth for the people. It's called uh, demographics. India is a very young country. Okay, and we, uh, you know, aspire. I think in the new elections just announced, I think maybe a 9, 10 crore people will vote for the first time. And they're the new aspiration class of India. They demand the same thing as someone sitting in, you know, London demands is in Lucknow demands. There's no difference out there. And the third one is, you know, when I was much younger, Neil Armstrong went on the moon for the first time. And his first words, he stepped on another celestial body. The first human being to step on another celestial body was, it's a small step for man, but a great leap for mankind. Because you know we had conquered the moon for the first time. So in India, moving from bricks to clicks seems like a small move. But it's the digitization story that is driving this country. And digitization will play out in terms of delivery, how we get stuff, UPI, Aadhaar, uh, you know, interface, uh, direct payments that you get out there. It will play out in the opportunity set for young people who want a job in computers. They will do the BPO back work uh, out there. And it digitized almost everything. Everything in the world is now going to be digitized. In fact, I read in the financial times before I came here that all products in the world would be first made digitally and then they'll be made physically, right? So there's a massive opportunity in digitization. It will allow India to leapfrog 50 years of chronically bad infrastructure because you don't need that much digital infrastructure. And India's already, we are already ahead in the world in payments, the best in the world in payments, the best in so many things. A lot of the Google software is designed in Hyderabad and Bangalore and places like that. So I think it'll be a great leg up for us Indians because we are the right place at the right time. We have workforce. Here's a stat for you to remember. I mean, <clears throat> when I lived in California, no, I'm not talking when I live currently in California, I think the minimum wage is eighteen twenty dollars an hour. And unemployment rate is three percent. You cannot get people at the minimum wage to do your work for you. You pay someone, you know, not twenty dollars a year, but you pay them some five dollars an hour. You're gonna get the best cream of the crop coming out here and working for you. So I believe there'll be a second wave. We already had a software wave and that is being met now by AI. So I'm not very pretty sure about it. But there could be a second wave in the BPO business, the digitization business, doing the back office processing in India. Using AI, of course, which is a bit of the black card. There could be a second wave coming of that. So a lot of people will be employed in that, uh, this thing. The other theme is, you know, like a China plus one theme. If you start looking around, a lot of Indian people are not benefiting from that because people want to diversify the supply chain. So whether it's radiator companies, whether it's engineering companies, whether it's you know service manufacturers, whether it's assembly people, a lot of people are not diversifying to India. And that is starting showing through the balance sheets and the profit loss statements I've seen. So I think that will uh, you know be two themes that will power the next few days. So the overlying theme to you know put a bow around what I'm saying is the growth of the Indian middle class. It's being driven by three pillars, what they call it, demographics. Uh, democracy democracy, and digitization. These are three Ds that are driving this pillar. And then how do you play that? You try and, you know, scalp the digitization because those are where the opportunities are. Yeah. And digitization also means better corporate governance and democracy means better corporate governance. A lot of the public sector sector have been transformed by better corporate governance. Mm -hmm. And democracy calls that. You know, people who want to be re-elected understand that they want to stop corruption, stop leakage and have better corporate governance. And that's been the transformational aspect, which I think is underappreciated yet. So I just, I wanted to share some perspective on the digitization thing, because I think, you know, I'm sort of quite deeply enmeshed in this. Uh, I think you're right that digitization, particularly in the AI side of things, will drive a lot of job creation in India, because I think what people don't appreciate unless they start working with the technologies, it's much more data intensive than people think. And so that requires more manual work to get things up and running. But if we look at what, even if we look at the software wave that's, that's gone, that's played out over the last 20 years, the the wealth it's created and the wealth that can still be created by the next wave of digitization, it's not nearly as broad as, let's say, what's happened in China with manufacturing. I think if we look at the direct and indirect jobs that are created through IT, that's maybe 10 million, 15 million at best if, you know, I don't have exact figures, but something in that range. We still have our middle class, if we, if we think about it from a quartile perspective, is still... Um, not formally employed there i think if we commonly use the india one india two and india three framework it's still people that are not in formal jobs because the formal sector is still so thin 
So do you think that can still change or are we always going to be this thin educated? It has to change. Class? For India to be a prosperous middle class country, it has to change. Do I have a clarity how it's going to change? No. But I think it provides a great deal of opportunity. We'll see. We'll see how this plays out. But I'm willing to bet on these companies that are doing the digital transformation because I think that will provide a huge opportunity. They might grow instead of 30% at 20%, you know, but that's good enough, uh, they grow. So it's difficult, you know, when looking at the future, it's, it's extremely uncertain. So I don't know exactly how this plays out. But I know that I'm bullish in this country. And this is what I learned from all my friends, to remain bullish in this country. And that has shown up in the opportunity set available. Now, you have to put your bet somewhere. You can put it on, you know, the consumers, which is a good place to put your money in. Digitization. You know, there are many themes you can play. There are many ways to skim this cat. I'm just suggesting to you one or two ways that I'm looking at. When I came here, I was reading a paper in the afternoon. Someone told me that the most important way to play all this is electricity. Because electricity is uh, going to be in short supply. Because the AE requires so much electricity. The electric automobiles obviously require electricity. So electricity demand, people who make generators, people who generate electricity, people who, uh, you know, make the parts will all do well. So maybe that's something I would look at also. But you know, there are lots of opportunities. I'm not saying I have the opportunity. But people who say that these opportunities are not there, I'd like to remind them that forget what happened in India. In a mature market like America, okay, you had a company like NVIDIA go up from, you know, a few hundred million dollars I think in 2005, if not mistaken, it was you know, a few hundred million, four billion dollars. Today, it's a couple of trillion dollars, all right? So, you know, the opportunities every day, Facebook, Meta, Google, uh, Amazon, all came up in the last 20 years. So, there's great opportunities everywhere in the world. People who understand uh, digitization will, I think, prosper eventually. That's that's uh, that's very useful. And I think it's, it's, it's very poignant, once again, to remind our viewers that you should always stay invested in India. So just one last question from me today, because I think I know you're a fairly voracious reader and that's served you really well as an investor. So for anyone that's trying to upgrade themselves, upskill themselves, um, what, what sort of reading material, how would you, what would you recommend they use to become better investors? Well, I think the first most important thing is to read. If you want to be a good investor, I don't know anyone who has been a really good investor without reading. You could become a trader and you could do fairly well for yourself. But to be a good investor, you need to read almost all the time. And it's not really that important what you read. Uh, you know, you could read biographies, you could read investing books, you could read balance sheets, you could read, you know, newspapers, magazines, whatever. But I think to be a good, really good investor, you need to read like four, six hours a day. So that's quite a commitment you're making about 30, almost like a part-time job of reading. Um, and you need to develop the temperament, you know, to be a loner, to think for yourself, to do your own homework, all those are important. So what would I recommend to read? I mean, first of course, just read. But if you're particularly interested in becoming a better investor, I think the two best investors are Buffett and Munger that I know. So there are a lot of books about them, uh, about Buffett and Munger that I read. The Berkshire Hathaway shareholder letters are a good place to begin with. Uh, you have a plethora of choices out there. Start slowly. I mean, if you can't understand Munger right away, it takes years to understand Munger or Buffett what they say because they speak in parables and you really need to kind of drill down after some perceived wisdom in order to understand truly what they mean. But I think if you, as I think Munger put it, that if you keep reading, every day you'll become just like maybe a tiny nanometer fraction more smarter. And that will compound over the next, next 5, 10, 20 years and make you a truly good value investor. So my first advice to everyone is just start reading. Start with whatever makes sense to you. The newspaper, Forbes magazine, a Fortune magazine, you know, Wall Street Journal. Then maybe a book on a good investor. And then maybe move up to Berkshire Hathaway letters and so on and so forth. But do read. The power of knowledge compounding as well. That, that, that's what it is. It, you, that is your raw material. You don't need much else. You know, you don't need to learn a slide ruler, or learn a, be a structural engineer or, you know, be a, this is a business that requires reading. Well, that's, uh, it's really beautiful. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Thank you so much for your advice. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. It's, it's always a pleasure, Varun. I'm always happy to come out and talk to young people. You're doing a good job. And, you know, I hope uh, the audience uh, understands that, you know, part of the fun is also in the journey. Uh, not, uh, you know, you enjoy... Uh, Someone asked me in some conference, 
and I quoted Warren Buffett there. They said, how do we become like you, but faster? And I said, enjoy the journey. I mean, I'd rather have a full head of hair. I'm out of hair right now than the money. And <laughs> But, you know, I think people somewhat are impatient when they're young. But I think uh, develop the temperament, which includes patience. Uh, in the long run, you'll be better off by doing that. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure. So, <laughs> there's our director's question, if we have a few minutes. So, first of all, it's an honor sitting behind the camera and listening to you live, sir. Uh, my question is like your career has spanned more than three decades uh, in the market and we have uh, like heard stories of uh, Warren Buffett and Rakesh Junjunwala. They have that one stock in their portfolio like Coca-Cola for Warren Buffett and Titan for Rakesh Junjunwala. So what's your Titan or Coca-Cola been in your three decades? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the lessons that I learned in the stock market. What differentiates someone like me from a truly great investor like Rakesh or Warren Buffett? is that when they had a great idea, they backed up the truck and bought it, okay? That's very important to understand the stock market. You know, you can do well if you bought like me, buy, you know, 50,000 shares of this and one lakh shares of that or 25,000 shares, of that. that's good enough. But if you truly have convinced about an idea and great opportunities and great ideas are very rare, it's not that you go to one, you get one every five years or something. At that time, you need to back up the truck and buy. And Rakesh Jinnala backed up the truck and bought Titan. Warren Buffett backed up the truck and bought uh, Coke. And that's why they're called the greatest investors. Now, it's not easy to do. It's very easy to speak and say that I'll back in the truck. But remember, you're dealing with uncertainty. You're dealing with, you know, unknown. You're dealing with, you know, the risk of losing money. So in order of being a great investor, you need to conquer all of that, you know. So I'm, I'm a hobby to write 10% of the company. I live and dream, dream and breathe that every day. Is it going to happen? Who knows? <laughs> well, you're being very humble, sir, because you're one of the greatest investors in India I have ever seen. So. That's too kind of you, but... If only my wife would think that, I'd be a happy man. <laughs> she would definitely think that in her heart, sir. But one more last question. It's a funny question. What's the relation between you and Radha Krishna, Radha Krishna Dumani, sir? Oh, that's that's actually easy. Uh, he and I met uh, in the Bombay Stock Exchange. We just happened to share a common surname. We are not related. Uh, but, uh, you know, in America, they have a concept called the dream team. You know, you look up the yeah. sports players order. And I actually was lucky when I came to the stock exchange the first day I met Chandrakant Sampath, I met R.K. Damani, I met Rakesh Jinjinwala, I met Durgesh Bhai from Enam, Nimesh Bhai from... All these great people I met within a few weeks of each other. It's like I sent you to America and within a few weeks you met Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Peter Lynch, John Templeton, you met all of them. I mean, you would say everyone's a good investor. I happened to meet them and they all became great investors who taught me a lot. So we are deep personal friends. But, uh, and he asked me, as you know, to uh, be on the board of his company, yeah. Avenue Supermarts, which was a great honor for me. Uh, but uh, more than that, he's a teacher to me, a mentor to me, uh, someone who made me uh, understand how to dream. As I said in a memorial, uh, in a quote about him, I said, he didn't make us wealthy. I do agree because of his thought process, we all became wealthy. But more than wealthy, he made us wise. That's a really good note to end this podcast, but it's been an honor like to just be sitting here, sir. Thank you so much for your wisdom, sir. Thank you so much for your kindness. This podcast is produced by Lexio Equities Private Limited, a study registered research analyst. Registration number INA 00004787. The information provided in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Investment in securities markets are subject to market risk. We strongly advise all investors to read all related documents carefully before investing.